cleaned up here and let's see what I can do here. <laughs> All right, that's gross. You might want to pot. <laughs> I might want to pot that audio down. <laughs> <laughs> just checking levels. Yeah, just checking levels. That's it. <laughs> I just. Pray uh, so, how you doing, everyone? Thanks for joining us today. We are uh, on our normal pre-roll while Bernie gets his pillows set up. <laughs> yeah, my my background is the most important part of the show. <laughs> Let's see. All so right, let's look at see. that. We got somebody watching. You know how that is. I'm an Hi, artist. Thanks. I'm an artist. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're going to have a great show today, Tony. I'm very excited about this. Oh, I am. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. we're going to Onset and Apple Box today, say. So hopefully we'll people yeah. will jump in and join the conversation and share the show. Yes. Please. Yes. Share please, the show. Please. Yes. If you haven't already, Absolutely. we have a YouTube page, Onset Lighting. If you haven't been over there, it's fantastic. We got so much content over there. Please go and like that page. <laughs> I think you'll really like it. You know what, Tony? This is a chance to, I'm going to just take it for uh, telling for people about Onset Lighting, which, of course, we have the full gamut of professional products for the production professional. And that is, I mean, we carry lines like Airy, Quasar, Aperture, Kinoflow. You know, we carry all of the heavy hitters in today's production community. You know, I am a gaffer. I own three grip and lighting trucks. I have a couple of vans too. When I buy a light, I buy it, of course, for the production value that it can supply. But I also buy it as an investment, and that's how I look at it. I want that light to pay for itself 500%, 1,000%, any number of um, – I want to make as much money from that product that I invest in as I can and at the same time supply my clients with what they want. That is the whole idea of what we have come up with at Onset Lighting. My partner, Nick Zagradich, has been selling product in Hollywood for 20 years. He is a product expert, and we really pride ourselves on that. As well, we carry a very large line of prosumer products as well. And that we are focusing down on this new medium, the new medium of professionalism that is live streaming. And we can offer services for you. We can build a studio out of any size. You know, we got packages from $500 up to $2,500. We can take care of whatever needs that you have in that. We can also supply services to stream from a remote location so you can bring your guest on with the least amount of technical expertise or, or problems that you have. But one of the things that I'm most excited about in this is we also have Onset University right now. And that helps you in your career. You know, we're on a reset now. With all this coronavirus stuff and the, the industry is entirely down, this is a total reset. It's a reset in your career. It's a reset in the way we will do work. It is a reset on every aspect of the production business model that we have. And I will tell you this, if you thought you missed something in your career before, you're the luckiest person in the world because now you get to do it over again. And you don't have to make those same mistakes. At Onset University, I've taken my, in my all my intellectual property and I have put it out there and it is for free right now. It's normally a $17.97 uh, uh, subscription rate. I've opened it up free for the next three months. You go on there and you glean all of that information that you can because it tells you how to position yourself in the industry. You know, who works in the market you work in. It tells you how to position yourself with a client so you become their number one call, even of your two or three right now. 
It tells you right down to the nitty gritty, the, the details, how to answer that first phone call from a client where they always say yes. So this is some of the stuff that we cover. Um, you're lucky I'm not in a big pitch motor. I'd tell you more right now, <laughs> but I just want you to know. I just want you to Don't know work. that this is a great opportunity <laughs> that you have right now. Please join me up there, and I'm going to be starting personal coaching too. So career coaching and live streaming coaching, personal coaching about how to reach your market and become a leader in it. So. I, I think I think I'm out of breath, Tony. Is the show over yet? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, do you want to get to the show sometime today? <laughs> sure. Let's do it. Let's. Go. All right. Let's let's get into it, buddy. All right. All right. Very good. Very good. I'm I'm going to share the show right now. You know, Robert, um, I, I tell you, dude, this is a real, real, um, this is going to be so great. Say hi, Bernie. Talk. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How you doing? I'm sharing the show. This oh, is sweet. it. This is it. I'm sure. Bernie's on okay, an attention span on. deficit hold today. <laughs> I am a total attention span deficit, Tony. I am. Uh, I'm just looking for the show so I can share it to my my personal site because I know I've got a lot of people over there that are, are big on that. So let me see if I can get that. Here we go. I'm going to share. I'm going to share it now. All right. I am shared. There we go. Hey, Sweet. are we here? All right. Very good. Very good. So my, my, have we gone into the opener, Tony? Are we, uh, are, are we live on the show now? I mean, I know we're live. I know that. But, but uh, is the show officially started where I introduce my guest. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you're definitely. <laughs> well, we'll run it again for you. How's that? Welcome back, Bernie. Today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, Robert Jolly, DP. And I have known Robert for years and years. I, I, you know, it goes way back, I don't know, 2003, 2004, in that ballpark somewhere. And Robert and I worked on all kinds of little small productions. I had just my van then. And Robert and I were people who always talked about our dreams, talked about the things we wanted to do in the industry. And we would sit there and just, you know, talk and figure out and strategize ways that we could improve our careers and get bigger. And like a lot of relationships, you know what I mean? You take a Y in the road and you split apart. You're still connected. You still know each other. You, you enjoy every time you get to see each other, but you don't work with each other a lot at, the, at that any given time. And, you know, I went on to have a career and build Bernie's Grip and Lighting and had a lot of trucks and was sending a lot of jobs out, was very successful. Robert went another way. He went towards the DP route and directing and doing that sort of things. And had a wonderful, fantastic career we're going to talk about today. But Robert is somebody that when I have him back, it reminds me and it reminds both of us how far we've come in this industry. And Robert, I just want to welcome you and thank you so much for being here today. Hey, <laughs> you are welcome. Thanks for having me, uh, Bernie. It's good to be back after, right. I think, two years was the last time I was on your show. Yes, two years, and then before that, I don't know if I had seen you. Um, you know, I don't know if I had seen you before that for for about five years. You yeah. know, I mean, it seems like I see you every day on social media. You know, and that's <laughs> kind of the other skew of this. You always know what someone's up to. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I don't know if we had physically seen each other, and we're still not in the same room. You're you're uh, where? Where are you coming? 
I'm I'm living in northwest Idaho. So if you look at a map of Idaho, I live at that part that's really skinny up towards Canada. Um, about we're about two hours south of the Canadian border in a town called Coeur d'Alene, which um, okay. you know some people are familiar with. Others, you know, you people have heard the name, and I I didn't really know where it was before we moved here, but I yeah, it's I'm hearing a little feedback. Um, anyway, it's, yeah. uh, yeah, that's Me where too. I am. It's, it's a, it's a very beautiful place. It's still a little cold up here. That's why I'm still wearing, you know, some warm clothes, but yeah, I still have, I'm still a California boy too. I'm, I'd love to be wearing some flip flops, shorts and a t-shirt right now. Exactly. Is it? Well, I'm a Northwest guy, you know, I'm originally from Tacoma, Washington. So I certainly know the Idaho, what Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon area very, very well. Um, and used to, for years and years, even when I lived in California, I would go up and visit some very dear friends up in uh, um, um, uh, Sun Valley, Idaho. Uh -huh. You know. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it specifically Haley, if you know where that's at. I do. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I love Idaho. It's a great, great state. So Robert, <laughs> buddy, buddy, buddy. So you're working now. I know that you do what Alaska Frontier, right? I yeah, I did a television show called Alaska: The Last Frontier for Discovery Channel yes. for for four years. I was the director of photography for the series for four years straight. Um, prior to that, I worked on the show as a guest camera operator um, while I was mixing with other. I was mixing that with other projects I was working on in Hollywood. So it was it was a, a good opportunity to network and and uh, you know. Uh, stepping stone towards another opportunity, which turned into that. So I was working on that show until just last year, 2019, from roughly 2016 to 2019. So my life has almost been exclusively focused on Alaska, which is kind of kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's wild. Um, I've seen all those, and I, you know, we talked last time. You were right, actively involved in that in that show directly. Mm -hmm. You know, I've just got to say it was it was uh, so fascinating to hear all of the stuff and the stories. And you know what? I'll tell you, my wife and I actually watched that show. I I I, I would watch it even if we didn't like it because you do it. <laughs> but we love the show. It's got oh. great characters. I mean, those people are just so nice, and you feel like you're you're hanging with them. So the way you shoot that is is I've just got to very much compliment you. We really well, enjoy you. the show. Thank you, you know? thank you. And you know, I, people in our industry, we don't watch TV like no, other people, right? No, we don't. You know, no. we're looking at the shots, we're looking at this, we're looking at that. But uh -huh. I totally lose myself in it and, and and really like it. Well, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, a lot of a lot of my friends and family that aren't in the business, they'll ask me, "Hey, have you seen this recent Netflix series or this new show on Amazon or whatever?" And I'll be like, "Uh." You know, I just I draw a blank and I'm like, uh, no, I haven't. They're like, it's really good. Everyone's watching it. And so I feel like, you know, what you're saying is true. We're in the industry. We're so busy working that in our downtime, at least I'm going to speak for myself. In my downtime, I have other pursuits I like to work on besides just sitting and watching television shows. Although I will admit I've, I've started to get hooked on some older shows on Netflix, courtesy of my better half, Lisa. She's introducing me to all kinds of stuff. So. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm trying to. I'm trying to the keep Netflix. up on the, on the latest greatest, so I can have conversations with people. Yeah, you know the strangest thing has occurred actually with my wife and I um, since we've been in lockdown here, and that has been we for some reason have been totally gravitating to Spanish language movies and doing really? the subtitles. Okay. You know? Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, we started out with the uh, the drug lords, you know what I mean? And there's so uh -huh. many Spanish, you know, productions that are that cover that subject really good, and uh, but it's it's amazing. Like we don't even think about it anymore. <laughs> we'll just go, oh yeah, this. We don't even think about it being in Spanish, you know. Uh -huh. And I'll tell you something: you have to actually, and maybe this is part of the deal. You actually have to participate so closely in that by reading subtitles oh, you know yeah. if you've got your phone and you're flipping it you'll miss the whole point of the show you know and um <laughs> and so Spanish, I, I think that's it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
Well, uh, Lisa so, and I have been watching a series. Um, I don't recall the title, but it's a it's a French it's a French series. It, I kind of look at it as uh, extended episodes of Law and Order. It's it's a four I think it's a four episode arc. Uh, Deadly Seasons is the name of it, and I just okay. suddenly I was suddenly told in an inspiration the name. Uh, but <laughs> but what you're saying is true. It's it's all in French with English subtitles, and I've really enjoyed it. Stylistically, it's a little different than what we're used to here in the states, um, right? But it's just refreshing to to get a different take on the murder mystery, and and um, it's scripted, which is not a lot of the work I've been doing lately. So it's refreshing to watch scripted material instead of documentary or reality material. So yes, it's, like it's yes. an injection of creative ideas and stuff, if if you will. No, it that that is a lot of fun, and you know, I do. We were wa- watching a couple of Colombian productions and I really love the storytelling in there. And I don't know how I could just say it was different, but they followed several different lines of the story at Mm -hmm. one time, Mm -hmm. you know, and they did it so seamlessly. You never lost your place. It was never, there was never any feeling like you were interrupted with something or, you know, it went to a too far of a different place. They did yeah. it so brilliantly, and there was sixty episodes in this wow. thing uh, as what well. What was it called? Which what, it, it, it was it was Surviving Escobar, Surviving and it's the Escobar. story of Escobar's hitman JJ, who uh-huh. turned out to be sort of a celebrity. He's I think he's passed away now, but turned out to be sort of a celebrity for being Escobar's Escobar's hitman. <laughs> but it showed. Uh, the story, and I think, you know, there was a portion dramatized, but yeah. his story of being in jail, but it told a greater story of what was happening to the country of Colombia at that time. Ah, you know, right, right. Which was just, I, I would suggest anyone watch that on Netflix that was Surviving Escobar. Okay. You know, so it was very good. Yeah, that's yeah. you know that, that's one of the I think one of the coolest things about the streaming services, um, particularly Amazon and Netflix, since they have such a vast library of material, international and domestic stuff. Is you know you can get exposed to things that normally we would have never seen pre-streaming days. It was either cable oh, TV, maybe so HBO, true. or cinema, uh, Cinemax. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And um and and now I mean like. Well, to give you an example, when I was in the South Pacific recently working on a new series, the Netflix in that part of the world is different than the Netflix we have here in the States. Okay. And the cool thing about that is when you sign on to Netflix the first time thinking, oh, Netflix is Netflix. Well, it's not. There were shows there on that Netflix. I, I don't even sure how to refer to it. The South Pacific Netflix, the, you know, the Pacific region Netflix that I've yeah. never even heard of on the Netflix in the United States. And so, again, it's it's that reach, you know, that that one service has to open up the world to film goers and, yes. and those of us that are, are craving yes. something a little different to enlighten us or entertain us or, you know, just to, to give us a, a taste of somebody else's way of telling stories. And now, and now we are in this, and I, I think this is a greater subject too, but we are in this wonderful time where that is just opening up. Netflix mm-hmm. is the first big player they're all coming in now so i'm very excited to see what we come up with in this you know there's been a few like i i I don't know if you've heard an app called and 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 we're just riffing now i want to get to your your story too but yeah yeah there was a new thing an app called you know and um i went through that and it was just like to me sort of the worst of cable tv (laughs) made for the phone in 10 minute pieces and I thought please 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 haven't we had enough of this you know what I mean <laughs> haven't we you know I'm not ready to throw it out you know what I mean it's a baby yeah. so you know it, it it can mature it can find audiences I'm sure but but uh, I I thought it was at the first first breath I thought it was a bit of a waste but Robert let me let me not ramble on anymore oh, no, hey, let's rambling is fine Let's talk about your situation now. You were uh, caught in a situation. You were filming down in the South Pacific. 
-hmm. You were doing a project. You can't talk about the project. I understand that. You know what I mean? Um, But you were caught in a situation when this COVID thing hit. Take us from there. Tell us about your process. What happened to you? Who was on your crew and, and the process of getting out of there and back to States? Yeah, sure. Well, just to give you a little taste of what it is I was doing, you know, I always, people always say, well, I'm working on something, but I can't tell you about it, you know, and that right. always kind of bugs me a little bit because it's like, you know, come on, give us a taste, right? Why'd you um, tell me? Yeah. <laughs> it, I've, offline, I've, I've given you probably more information than I'll ever talk about online for now, but, right. you know, eventually the right. client will have a, a rollout and, a, you know, they'll do a preview and a commercial and a trailer and promos and stuff. But it's uh it's it's for one of the major streaming platforms, and um and the premise of the show is we're working in different well it's not the premise but our locations are different parts of the world we're in uh, the South Pacific and Central America, and um, I was starting work on the show uh, the very initial beginning uh, shooting in Tonga and we were scheduled to be working in Tonga and American Samoa uh, sequentially. And uh, we started shooting uh, some U.S.-based portions of the show in January. And at that point, everything was moving along fine, and our schedule was set to have us working in the South Pacific up until the middle of July, which we were all really excited about because, you know, the South Pacific is a beautiful place. It's a beautiful part of the world. And um, anyway, we got there in February and started working as normal. And that's just about the time this terrible over and, and spreading around the world. And you know, I think that uh, we were working in a part of the world that's a little bit more isolated. Tonga is, it's a kingdom made up of roughly over 120 islands, um, you know, some large, some small. But uh, the population of Tonga is roughly 100,000 people. And it's a place that's not easy to get to. It requires extensive travel just to arrive. I left from Spokane, flew to LA, from LA to Sydney. Sydney to uh, Auckland, and then Auckland in to- into Nokalofa, Tonga. And that took me roughly two days, you know, just with all the flight connections. Wow. So to get wow. there, it takes, it takes a lot of effort. We had a crew from, the, from New Zealand and from the United States working together. Um, we started in roughly February, and we were working r- up until about the middle of March. And that's when it became quite apparent that things were not going well around the rest of the world when we started getting news of uh, you know, different television shows shutting down for one reason or another, uh, especially the European shows, which was understandable considering what was happening there. And then our client, right. Disney, <clears throat> decided that their shows should start uh, ceasing operation until further notice. And we literally were thinking, hey, we're on a small island. There's no cases of coronavirus in this part of the world. They've effectively limited who can come to the island. Um, so we should be okay. So we, you know, we really wanted to just keep going as long as possible. And then borders started closing, international flights ceased operation. And then we realized, okay, this is, this is for real. We're probably going to have to stop and go home. And just at about that time, our amazing production team, our line producer and production manager, who those guys, I will give them props, you know, day and night until the end of time. Those guys worked as hard as they possibly could to keep us going. But when it became apparent that we needed to leave, they jumped into action to find us a way to get back. Because at that point, Tonga was closed. The air- airport was closed. The borders were closed. You couldn't get there. We well, couldn't leave. That was the other problem. So for about uh, mm, two weeks, I'd say two and a half weeks, we had no idea if we were going to be on extended leave in Tonga or if we were <laughs> somehow going to find our way home to our respective countries. And um, I think there was a little bit of trepidation there that we may very well be stuck in Tonga for several months. And, um, yeah. you know, due, was due that the, an act of thought? Were you guys talking about that? Like, like what do we do if we are stuck here? We did have that conversation. And, um, the, the other problem, well, we did have the conversation that we could continue working. I mean, if we can't leave, what else are we going to do with our time? Sit around the pool. Um, but then came the lockdowns, which, you know, the kingdom of Tonga, Despite the fact that it was still a coronavirus free country, they decided to lock down their country as well, much like what we're doing in the United States um, for purposes of, uh, I think, mainly just to safeguard their their society and, and in case something happened, they'd be ready. Prevention. Yeah, exactly. Prevention. Yeah. Yeah. So we were stuck in our hotel and we just were like, you know what, I think we really need to find a way to get home. So uh, that's what happened. That's kind of a really wordy explanation, but... 
we uh, were able to get a couple of charter flights in to pick us and the cast up to take us back to the United States. And the New Zealand contingent of our crew, uh, they had the same opportunity to, to go home. They only had a three-hour flight. <laughs> we had a three-day flight. It was hilarious. Uh, wow. You know, it, I mean, it wasn't hilarious. It was just we all expected it would take a while. We flew from Tonga to Hawaii. We had to overnight in Hawaii. And then we flew from Hawaii back to L.A. And with all the flight uh, shut down or rather cancellations, there were not as many flights available to get people home to their destination. So I'm sure patience. What was, was the, what was the flight like back from Hawaii? Is Hawaii just sort of abandoned now? Is there uh... um, well, we, we were really lucky to have, uh, we were on a charter flight from Tonga to Hawaii and the same flight from Hawaii to LA. So we didn't have to even go through the, the airport, the international airport there in Honolulu. We were, we went to the, to the, side of the airport where the jets, the business jets and, and so on depart out of. So we were lucky we didn't have to deal with that. But uh, once we got to LAX, it was pretty obvious things were different. I mean, I've got photos of me standing at the departures level in LAX and there are no cars. There's no traffic. And I'm so used to that area just being wow. bumper to bumper to bumper to bumper, you know. But, uh, you know, we got a it was a great, I shouldn't have graded, it was an experience, and uh, our line producer said that was logistically the most difficult thing that he's ever had to do in his 25 plus years of producing. So, it says a lot, but. Wow. It was. It wow. Was, I'm getting some feedback on that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's incredible, Robert, that's incredible. So at no time did you feel if feel felt in danger. I mean, no, at no all. time did you feel like you were in a bad situation. And ironically, you were probably in one of the safest parts of the world if they didn't have any cases there at the time. You know? Yeah. Well, and and that's that's true. They didn't have any cases, but if there was an outbreak, it would be a, a much different story. And the people of yeah. Tonga, the people of Tonga are amazing. They're genuine. They're kind. They're they're really willing to do anything they have to, to to make visitors feel welcome and comfortable. Um, that said, I don't think the medical uh, facilities are quite up to a level of being able to deal with something quite like corona, coronavirus right. has been, especially in the United States. So I think it was a good thing that we left. Um, yeah. But it's a beautiful yeah. place. I would go yeah. back in a heartbeat. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. That sounds – it sounds like a beautiful spot. I remember when you first went there. Of course, there was there was not all this lockdown and and things going on. I thought, man, that looks like the perfect place to be right now, you know. And uh, it was quite quite envious. But um, when you're on a project like that, and you've got you said you had just a really great production manager there uh, mm -hmm. with you and and working on stuff because that's who it's really rough on. Then oh, that, no. that person is the, the point person for all of this stuff, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and you've got to get them out. It really makes all the difference having somebody who knows what they're doing for sure. You know, um, well, you're, you're right about that. And in, in this situation was such uh, it was uncharted territory for everyone. No one has ever yeah. dealt with the fact that the entire world is shutting down. And with that, uh, scenario, how do you get people from one place on one side of the world to the other? You know, there's, there's no yeah. rules, there's no written, you know, A, B, and C. You just literally have to make it up as you go. And, and just to give you some, uh, a little context, the, uh, the line producer and production manager daily were talking to the ministers of health, the ministers of transportation, the people in charge of the airport, just to make sure that we were going to be able to bring an airplane from the United States and from New Zealand to get our crews home. And it could have changed minute by minute. I mean, I would look at these guys, I'd run into them in the hallway at the hotel and I'd say, hey, Richard, how are you doing? And he would just look at me with this exhausted look on his face and he would just shake his head. And that was usually a sign that things weren't going well. And then, wow. and then maybe an hour later, he'd be like, okay, I think we're back on course. You know, and it's just, you never know. And so, this wow. kind of a situation, just from wow. a logistic standpoint, you know, is incredibly difficult for the production staff. But then they're also managing a TV show, 
you know, so right. they, they have such a right. huge job on their hands. I, I have nothing but respect for those guys. That's so awesome. That's awesome. And then they chartered you a plane. So you had a plane coming specifically for you, yes. your crew, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then they took you to your respective destinations from there. Yeah. Once, once we got back to the States um, in Los Angeles, I just jumped on a Delta flight. And the director I was working with, we both went to the Delta terminal and he got on his flight. I got on my, my flight. <clears throat> we did the elbow bump before we left. It was kind of a token thing yeah. because we both came from a, a very safe place. So, you know, obviously. We were yeah, safe. you were both the same. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're on a plane for two days, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wait, and, I, uh, I, have a, you know, I actually have a question. Good to, see, good to see everybody leave with a smile on their face. Yeah. I mean, that was the a, most important thing is we, we got home. Well, and everybody's all right. Every, yeah. Everybody's all right. That's that's the – everybody made it home. That's the, the key element, you know. Um you know, tell me something like this. Maybe this is a good topic because I want everybody to know the process that you go through in a in a show like this. You know what I mean? What's your process when that show comes up? Just briefly, not not in a lot of detail, but run me through the first phone call, how you get on board, what you discuss on that. Is it you know rate where you're going? What this thing? Just give me a quick quick synopsis of that. Well, my first question to the the showrunners when they contact me is, you know, what's the story? You know, what is the show about? And once we go through that, I like to talk about the aesthetics. You know, visually, what's the language of the film or the the TV show or whatever it might be? And I want to get as much information from them uh, to help me inform some decisions I'm going to make, whether it be lens choices or camera choices or technology or, you know, how are we going to go about capturing the ideas they have in their head? And as you know, those conversations begin more conversations and they blend together. And there's a lot of evolution of right. aesthetics that, that happen over a course of, of time before we even start shooting. And then once shooting begins, there is more evolution visually and literature wise. And so uh, my process really is just to ask as many questions as I can think of. And I also recognize the fact that I'm forgetting to ask questions that need to be asked. And I hope that I can remember those down the line. But there's, you know, they always say preparation is everything. And that is absolutely the truth. Yeah, yeah. So when you're in the process of that, you start, you know, you start um, um, getting down the road with what the show is and stuff. When does this d discussion for rate come in? I mean, and how do you approach that? You know what I mean? Are you, when you're going out and you're, you're going to Alaska, you're going to exotic locations, there's a disruption in your life. Um, how do you handle that, that situation? Oh, that's, you know, it's, those are a lot of, a lot of questions in one. Um, <clears throat> the rate thing is, is something that, you know, the first, well, not one of the things I do like to bring up and just be very direct, you know, what, what kind of rate are you offering? And, and it's, it's hard to, it's hard to negotiate. I mean, that's one of the most uncomfortable things I think any of us have to go through is to negotiate what we think is fair for our services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once I'm given a number, I will uh, think it over and, you know, and, and, and decide, okay, if, if this kind of investment of my life uh, is worth to me is worth this much money. I'm going to come back to them and say, okay, this is what I feel like is fair. If you're going to have, ask me to be away from home for eight months at a time, you know, with uh, maybe a week off every now and then, that to me equals this amount of compensation. And I feel like, uh, you know, it comes down to a question of what kind of lifestyle, what kind of um, meaning does your life have? And does it translate into dollars or does it translate into something something else? And so there's a lot of philosophical questions I tend to ask myself when it comes to negotiating a rate. Um, right. Oh, okay. And, if, and if, if they're flexible, then that's usually a good group of people to be with because then they recognize also that, you know, hopefully your professional pedigree and abilities are worth discussion and meriting something a little better than what they're offering as a baseline. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's good. That's a good answer. I like that. Um, Tony, do we have a couple questions in there? Do we, do we have anything coming up? We have a question. Can everybody hear me now? Yep. Oh, I can hear yeah. you good, now. good, good. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what was going on before. 
So, <laughs> yes, David Weber, who is watching, thank you for uh-huh. watching. Oh, Dave. This is, uh, Dave. When you hit LAX, what was customs like getting back in the U.S.? Mm. Okay, Very well, <laughs> we didn't we didn't have to go through customs because we were on a business jet. So we, we were lucky we got to circumvent all of that. Um, we actually hit immigration coming back into Honolulu. So oh, once, right. once we landed in Honolulu, we were back in the American FAA-controlled uh, area. Um, interesting, though, when we landed, the, uh, the pilots, did, or I think it was either the pilots or the flight attendant, they just let us know, hey, when we land, before we can get off the plane, uh, the fire department, Honolulu fire department will come and take temperatures. Basically they'll, we'll go through the, uh, 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 an enhanced health inspection to make sure that we were, you know, able to land basically. So the plane landed, um, customs came on board to check passports and, uh, just find out who we were, make sure we were who we were said we were. And then that individual left the plane and then we were able to leave two at a time where fire department people did, temperature uh, checks to see if we were healthy. And once that was done, it was pretty much we were finished with any of the immigrations, customs, and otherwise. Uh, and at that point, you know, we were back in the American system. So the next morning in Honolulu, we got back on our jet, flew to LAX, and we landed on the south side of LAX down by uh, Atlantic Aviation in the, um, the business jet area. So we basically rolled out, got in a car, and drove to our hotel. Dave Weber. <laughs> Dave Weber, Dave Weber. He, Dave just sent me a text too of him watching the show, a picture of him oh, watching nice. the show. Which right on, man. I totally love. I oh, totally yeah. love. Thank Dude, you, send, Dave. Send, Thank send you. a text to me too, okay? I'm looking yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get that. Get that. It's, it's very funny. Very funny. You want to take um, a look at some video, videos, Bernie? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do it. You know what? I'll tell you. Let me just tell you this one thing. For the last nine years i have lived in this apartment here i have had cable tv and i cut the cable mm-hmm. i cut the cable uh the other day but they took the box out and i realized that's the only thing i've ever been referring to time for the last <laughs> nine years so i keep looking over like this to look at it i have no idea where we're at in the show so, yeah let's 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 go let's look at some some video tony Cool. All right. Uh, Robert, you can set this up. Let's let's take a okay. look at the Alaska, the last frontier bit. Which the explosion. Uh, oh, yeah. OK, so I love one, the explosion. I first I need to just uh, apologize for the the video quality is not quite up to my personal expectation because I was not, unable to get a copy of the completed uh, cut. But this was from Alaska, the last frontier season nine. And I think it's episode nine. Oh, seven it's called moving mountains and it was an episode where uh the kilchers needed to move some basically move a mountain so they brought a demolition expert in to help them and they planted i think it was like 55 charges in the side of a mountain and we blew up a mountain and um the reason i wanted to show this and share with everyone is is it's a fairly technical and complicated thing to do because you're dealing with explosives, which you know inherently are dangerous. But we did it on a very simple basis where uh, we had a small crew, we had our cast, we had a couple of uh, safety people and our demolitions expert. The fun thing was I had 13 cameras to play with. I had two drones flying and I had several cameras down on the ground. I think we had five GoPros and the rest were C-300s and an FS7 Mark II doing slow-mo. So it was kind of like, you know, it felt like we were doing a big action movie because we had so many cameras rolling on this one event. And um, all right. Anyway, that's enough talk. Um, I hope people enjoy it if they haven't seen the show already. All right. Let's take a look. Cool. Take Ready for the countdown. Ten.
bigger than we expected it. Oh my gosh, that's what I mean. The explosion blew my mind. <laughs> oh my god. Hug it. Was that like was that like better than death? <laughs> oh my freaking god, the explosion was awesome. It's almost like standing in the mine. It was just standing up here. Yeah. Oh my God. This is the largest explosion I've ever witnessed. Far beyond my expectation. Desmond Duffy does darn good. Donald, you. there right. you go. Thank you, sir. Right. For coming down and you did a very good yeah. job. That was amazing. This blast was exactly what we wanted. right, they were loaded right, the right quantity of powder was in each hole, it was initiated the right way, and it was delayed the right way, so it was an excellent blast, and everybody's happy. Wow. Boom. Wow. <laughs> that was unbelievable. That is a Michael Bay shot, dude. I mean, that is huge. Oh, man, That's it was fun. huge. It doesn't get bigger. Well, let's let's unpack wow. this a little bit. Wow. You know, how, how many cameras total did you use in that? We had 13, 13 total, including wow. the drones and the GoPros and the C300s and the Mark, the FS7. So basically, just real simple camera placement. I needed to get coverage on uh, the cast to get their reactions. And then I needed right. the, the money shot. So there was, there was a, uh, an Inspire that was up above that that really nice shot up above getting the entire mountainside blowing up. There was a second drone 90 degrees off to the side angle toward the ocean. So you could see the mountain explode with the ocean in the background. And then we had, uh, let's see, there's one, two, three, there were three GoPros down on the dirt road where all the debris landed. So we, you know, we were just hoping our cameras were in the right place and they, we got lucky. So we got debris and logs. And I think one of the cameras was, completely covered with dirt. We had a hard time finding it later. We color taped everything. So at least we had ropes leading to where the camera used to be. Um, yeah. And then we had, uh, there was an FS. Doesn't use slow motion, but we ended up, I think it made the cut towards the very end, toward the end credits. But yeah, it was 13 cameras. So it was like, just as if we were doing a, a movie, I just, you know, I, I took, charge of the action i just said all right you guys to make this work we need to go incrementally okay so we'll start with safety we'll make sure that the roads are locked up and that no one's going to come either direction we've got a confirmation right. of that on on walkie then once that was confirmed we got the drones up in the air once the drones were in position the drone pilots radioed back and said all right we're in position cameras are standing by <clears throat> we got all of our cameras up on the ground with the cast ready to go once they were set i said okay let's roll drones Drones were rolling. I got confirmation the cameras were speeding. Then we rolled our cameras up on top. Those cameras were speeding. The GoPros had been rolling for about a half hour at that point. So I was just hoping the batteries didn't die. And then once all yeah. the cameras were rolling and we were set, I turned it over to the demolitions expert, who's that really great character with the beard, an Irishman, hilarious, so much fun to work with. Then it was his show, and I said, you are the expert. Take it. And they just did their thing, and we just kind of followed it as best as we could. So, wow. it was a lot of fun, man. It was, wow. it was, yeah. What was your setup time like that? So all of that that you just did, unpacked for us there, what was your, how long did that take you from the guys putting the charges in? And was that done like the day before or did you do it all in the same day? No, they, they did, they had to drill holes. I think there were roughly 50 holes, vertical holes in that mountainside that needed to be drilled. So it was a very methodical, safe, slow process. You know, they didn't want to speed up and, mm -hmm. and just fast track anything. So I think we started two days before the actual filming to uh, set the explosives. Everything was set in, in the ground. And, and here's the thing that's important that I learned about was everything in the ground was safe until the fuses are set and the lines are drawn and everything runs back to the board and it's connected to the detonator. So, you know, it was a safe procedure to work around, but once everything was set, we backed off the mountain, 
set up our cameras and uh but the actual filming period i mean it took us maybe a half hour from the time that we were up on that okay. hillside ready to go wow 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 once you were set and how long did it take you to set those cameras uh we talked through the positioning uh initially when we started setting drilling the holes because we had to we needed to consider time of day, which, as you can see, it was later in the afternoon. Uh, time right. of day, weather, and distance. Um, there was initially a conversation to keep us back even further, and I, I said, you know, with safety in mind, I think we should try to get a little closer so that we can see the entire thing happen with our cast in frame, because mm -hmm. that'll sell it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yes. if we're doing the shot, reverse shot, it just doesn't feel quite as, yeah. you know, authentic. And, you know, yeah. we were a good, yeah. we were a good half mile away when that thing went off. So it was, or maybe a quarter mile away. So it was pretty safe. We have a couple of right. questions for you, Robert. Sure. Yeah, cool. let's go. Yeah. Uh, David Weber <laughs> again. Thanks, David. Uh, yes. Did all the cameras make it out alive from the explosion? Yes, they did. They did. The <laughs> GoPros were covered with dirt and soot and everything, but they survived and the footage is in there to see. So thank you. All right. We got another one. We've got somebody watching over on Twitter. I love this. Thanks for oh, watching. Cool. Ron, awesome. Roger. Thank you, Twitter. How thank many you, of the Twitter angles follower. of the 13 made it into the final cut? I uh, believe all of the cast coverage made it in um, both drone shots uh, I think all three of the GoPros did. There might have been one of the C300s that did not. And the slow-mo is is right at the end of the episode, uh, right before they roll the end credits. So, And I think I may have sent, sent you a clip of that. So I think basically all but one or two cameras. It was, once it happened, the funny thing is once it happened, even the operators, we were all angled on the cast. So the mountain was behind us and, and there was a lot of this going on. Whoa! Uh, and then you know, we were, uh, so, uh, some of the footage probably uh, could have been on the path, but hey, you know, whatever. It's a nice. documentary. Yeah, hey, <laughs> hey quick shout out to Jack yeah, Cummings. Yeah. Always a great show, Bernie. But thanks for watching, Jack. Really appreciate that. But, Thank uh, you. Yeah, that's Thank all we got you, for guys. questions. Thank we got more videos, you, Jack. Pictures. Yeah, what do you yeah. Let's see. We got. Yeah, we got a we got a lot. Uh, we got a lot of viewers. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Um, let's take a look at some pictures. Why don't you walk us through some pictures right now and just give us a f some feedback on, on what you were doing that day, what you were setting up, just okay. kind of give us an overview of, uh, of, of your process, you know? Okay. This is how we really shoot TV shows. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, let's get real. Let's okay, get okay, real. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we were sc location scouting that day and that was, uh, myself and Malcolm, Malcolm Clement, one of our New Zealand camera operators on this recent project. And we were literally trying to frame up shots uh, that we might utilize. And, you know, we're both doing the same thing, but we're just trying to come up with some ideas on how to, to cover a scene a certain way. So it looks kind yeah. of silly, but we literally were working. <laughs> it looks like you're fishing, actually. <laughs> well, <laughs> Maybe we were no going to we were going to film a yeah. fishing scene later. That could have happened. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. and then what what are we looking at here? This is uh, with Brent Lofke. He's a an Orange County based director, and sure, um, this was several years Brent. ago. You know Brent. Sure. Um, I was shooting a document. Uh, it was a, a marketing project for a, an OC based company, a company there in Irvine that builds uh batteries and okay it, this is a semi truck uh it's the cab and i'm underneath the cab shooting the batteries i've had a lot of trust in the guys that prop that thing up so it was safe <laughs> but it was yeah, just, right it was right. a great great experience working with brent brent's one of the most prepared directors i've ever worked with because he comes in with basically the shot list literally the shot list that he wants to try and get and it's almost paint by numbers from that uh, standpoint. Um, he's got so much experience too. You know, you just you move really, really quick. Oh, Brent's, uh, yeah. yeah, Brent's a, a total pro. Yeah, no, I, hey. I love working with Brent. I haven't seen him in a long time. Real but, quick, uh, Robert. David yeah. Weber wants to yeah. know what framing app do you use? Framing app. Um, oh, for my iPhone. I'm yeah. assuming it was for the previous shot. 
Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I think that day we may have just been using our, our iPhone cameras just to get a general idea of what might, might or might not work. Um, I normally would carry around um, a DSLR with you know, a set of lenses to kind of frame that way. But I think that day it was just sort of run and gun. You know, we were just trying to get through the day and visit a bunch of different locations. So, mm -hmm. sorry. Good Not anything time. really, really interesting there. Yeah. Um, yeah we got somebody, uh, yeah. Oh, um. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is, okay, this is an example of working really closely with your crew. Um, the guy in the foreground is one of the, the best and most enjoyable field producers I think I've ever worked with. And very organized, good guy. The, uh, the dude behind there is uh, our AC, our first AC, Charlie, and he actually lives in Anaheim, so I love working with him. Okay. Oh, uh, great. Robbie there in the foreground, he's, uh, he's from Thousand Oaks. So a good contingent of California crew guys, um, shooting with a couple of FX9s and Cook S4 lenses. I believe we were doing an interview, and Malcolm is on the far side. You can't really see him, but... Um, love those cameras. Uh, of course the cook look is one of my favorites for primes and uh, we're just having a good day there. Charlie, I have to give him props. He's probably, probably my favorite first AC I've worked with ever. Guys always prepared doing things that I don't even think of or ask for. And in this case, it was a million degrees out there and he pops up with an umbrella, gives us a courtesy just to cool us down a little bit. You know, sometimes the smallest things are, you go the longest way, you know, it's, it's the most cool. important. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. For I always sure. say, don't forget yeah. to say thank you to your camera assistants because those guys will keep you rolling and they will make make or break your day for you. Oh, Almost. they will save your life, dude. That, yeah, your AC, your whole crew, your whole crew. Oh, yeah. You should be a unit. They should oh. be working towards that goal. You know what I mean? That's that's why it's so important. What else have we got, Tony? We got more picks. This is uh, here we got Malcolm and Lance. Uh, these guys work so hard. And you can see how sweaty they are, but they work hard. Their uh, Tonga is like working in a hot yoga session all day long. And these two guys mm -hmm. never did I see them not smiling and just happy to be working. And man, the work, that the, the material they shot, I was sitting and watching and just humbled, you know, they just kick ass. So a couple of great guys. And I, I hope yeah. to get back together with them again and finish up this show. Um, That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, just shooting a little B-roll there on the on the side of the ocean there. Yeah. On coral. Uh, big 300 millimeter lens. And Tony, just a, yeah. Oh, just yeah. Say, it's Go a ahead. 300, 300 mil lens with a doubler. So shooting waves at 600 mil, 120 frames per second can be pretty exhilarating to to see through the lens. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Now I can't see the pictures from where I'm at here. I'm oh. just getting your feed. So, to, yeah, okay. you tell me what we're looking at because I can't oh, see them. All right. Uh, location scout and some caves. Uh, just checking out a possible okay. shooting location. Don't want to say too much more about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'm already going to get in trouble. Uh, there. Okay. <laughs> this, this is actually really, uh, this is interesting. Several years ago, I was hired to do some plate photography for a television show that I think never went to series, but it was for CBS called the, uh, the 11th. Oh, gosh. I Honestly, I can't remember the name. It's something like the 11th uh, District or 13th District. It was a science fiction show. But anyway, we were shooting plates for driving shots, basically. And um, as you can see, we have three uh, 5Ds mounted. We were shooting video. And that would be projected or composited on green screen shots of the principal cast when their coverage was shot on, on stage, essentially doing their driving scenes. And then this stuff is composited in the background to look as though they're driving through the city streets of San Francisco. So pretty oh, simple, pretty okay, simple rig. Very interesting. Um, this is an oldie but goodie. Uh, Brian Tweed, one of my good old friends from, uh, I think he, uh, I, I don't know Brian remember. Tweed very yeah. well. Yeah, known yeah. Him for so long, I can't remember uh, when we met. But uh, we were doing a shoot in uh, Ortega Wilderness, or uh, it was on Ortega Highway. I, I don't remember the name of the park, but here in Orange County, we've got looks like we've got his one of his cranes out there and some different cameras on tripods. It was a documentary shoot. Um, okay, really good time. 
Yeah. Um, this this is a shot from uh, two years ago. I was in New Orleans doing some interstitials for a, an LA based marketing company, and uh, we're doing some period stuff. It was a lot of fun, and um, <laughs> a little bit more of the period stuff in New Orleans. Shooting with the uh, Sony FS7 Mark II. Um, just doing some little commercials and promos and such. Uh, okay, this one here, I, Bernie. It's too bad you can't see these photos because they're yeah, kinda... yeah. I'm just seeing your feed right now, unfortunately. Okay, uh, Tony, this... is there any help you can give me on that? Uh, let's see. We're Not looking at right let's keep now, going, Bernie. We're taking a look at uh, this is a location shot from Alaska, from the last frontier. Uh, this is Josh McKell, one of the camera operators. And, uh, you know, as you can see, it's pretty vast and snowy. And that was, that was kind yeah. of the, the name of the game. You know, we'd go out in all kinds of weather situations and environments and, and try to get good material. Um, every day was a challenge because you didn't know really what to expect. And, um, you know, it tests your ability to be prepared and to uh, think on your feet. And Josh was fantastic. Like, he turned in some of the best material I've ever seen. So... You get lucky, you know. With the yeah, people. that's great. No, that's great. And you know, when you're in a wilderness, I'm looking at it, my phone right now. But uh, when you're in the wilderness out there like that, you know, this is one thing that I think a lot of people don't understand. You are actually in the wilderness. I mean, you can yeah. get lost. You can get hurt. There's yep. that's the real world out there. You know, I mean. Maybe more dangerous to be in traffic. I don't know, but <laughs> but certainly uh, you have to have a whole different situational awareness when you're yeah. working like that. Yeah, you do, and that's and that's really true. And you know, it, it, it's you have to be aware of your situation, but you also have to keep in mind what you're there for, and you can't let your work slide while you're trying to you know navigate through the forest. You still have to. It's a weird balance, and some guys get it, and some guys don't. Um, it's a, it's an acquired skill, I believe. Uh, right, right. Uh, right, right, right now we're just looking at a shot. I was doing a documentary film years ago in China about a, a it was an artist, a Chinese artist. And, um, uh, we were shooting in the forbidden city and my camera assistant, he loved to shoot stills. And so he was just firing off some stills and that's a great shot. dude. Good. That's a great <laughs> shot. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's yeah. perfect. That says on the road right there. Where's this one at? Uh, this is St. Petersburg, Russia. So oh, it was a, wow. the documentary shoot, oh, we were on the Neva River um, doing some work on a boat. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't really have many shots of the cast. Just It's that thing where, you know, clients want to keep everything under wraps until their show is finished. And so I try not to, to try not to shoot a lot of photos of cast members or the production happening oh yeah you gotta stay away from that those, for sure uh, yeah. uh, requests so yeah uh, a little bit more china footage here great wall on the great wall yep yeah um and this is just mm, a that's beautiful this is a this is an example of what i get to see i feel lucky and blessed to be able to see this kind of stuff when i'm working you know we were filming an episode for last frontier and i had my still camera with me my 35 millimeter, my film camera. And I had a moment where I could just fire off some stills and, you know, like this is completely un, unplanned and uh, unrehearsed. It just was happening. And I decided to fire off some shots and I don't know, you know, this is uh, this is one of the perks of, of the job. So beautiful. Yeah. No, to go everywhere and see everything, you know, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty yeah. of it. True. Um, um, little night this shot. right here. What are we looking at? Oh, this is a this is a night exposure in um, in Alaska again. So much Alaska stuff, you know. I promise I can do yeah. other products. <laughs> uh, yeah. And a, what a part? Of, what shot. part of Alaska are you actually in? What is it? The southern part on the Panhandle? Uh, it's the southern. It's south central. So if you were in Anchorage and you went due south by car about four hours, you'd hit the Kenai Peninsula, and Homer, yeah. Alaska is the, is the location. Is the base. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Now, previous yeah. to that, I was uh, the director of photography for another series, but it was in southeast Alaska, quite a bit further south, closer towards uh, Seattle or Pacific Northwest. Um, a much yeah. different look, 
you know, but still very much Alaska in the respect that the people live off the land and they spend a lot of time kind of, you know, forging their own destiny and, and doing their own thing. And I think that right. in general, that's kind of what's uh, typical of Alaskans. They tend to want to do their own thing without much help from outsiders. And that makes for very good uh, documentary film and television material because they lead lives that are fascinating and different from what you and I are used to. Sure. So, no, whole different world, right? You know, yeah. whole different yeah. set of set of survival values. Absolutely. Well, Robert, dude, this has been, you know, once again, the hour goes so fast when you're doing these oh. and talking to a friend even more. Um, tell us, first of all, how can we get a hold of you? How does somebody get a hold of Robert Jolly? Um, you can find me on, um, I'm on Facebook and, under Robert Jolly. And uh, I'm also on Instagram. I have an Instagram handle of film for you. It's film, the number four, Y-O-U. And then I also have another one. It's Robert Jolly, Jolly spelled J-O-L-L-E-Y, D-P. So those are the three Great. places that are best to find me. And I don't do Facebook as much as I used to, but I, I do log on there occasionally. And so if you send me a message yeah. there or on Instagram, I will respond. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. Now, what's on the agenda? What does your schedule look like? Are you just in lockdown? Uh, do, do you have any date to come back? No dates yet. You know, yeah. we're just we're just kind of standing by and hoping that uh, our network and the production company will find the value in putting us back to work to finish doing the marvelous project that we started. I, I feel so proud and and happy uh, just for the few, I guess, for the month and a half that we were able to shoot. Uh, the material we got was exceeded my expectations, and I know the clients were really happy. Uh, it was a great start. And then to just be shut down, you know, cold turkey like this it was really difficult for everyone. Yeah. But I'm I'm going to be very optimistic and say that uh, I think we will be back, uh, back to work. I don't know when. My guess would be September, October, realistically. But, yeah. you know, no one knows. In the meantime, you know, I, I'm so used to the stop and go nature of, of this business that I'm, I'm going to just mentally... This is a stop period, and maybe yeah. it'll be a little longer than what we like, but yeah. uh, determination, optimism, uh, just patience. I think those are going to be the big the big determiners as to whether we all come out of this and s semi-sane <laughs> or yeah. you know, hey, ready to go. Robert, a couple Agreed. of people have asked you to repeat your contact info, and for those oh, watching, sure. we'll actually put it in the comments as well. So Definitely. Yeah. Um, so I'm on Facebook uh, under Robert Jolly. And I'm also on Instagram. My Instagram uh, name account is uh, film for you. It's film, the number four, and then Y-O-U, you. I also have a second one. It's Robert Jolly DP. And my last name is J-O-L-L-E-Y. It's just a, a common mistake people make. Totally understandable. It's E-Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Robert, cannot thank you enough, my brother, for being with us today. And uh, it's a pleasure just to get to talk to you again. I can tell you that, you know. Bernie, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. yeah, thank you, buddy. Thank you. All right. And that is, I think, today's Bernie's Apple Box. We will see everyone back here at 2 o'clock next Friday. And I've got a guest, but I'm not going to announce her yet. But you're going to love this woman. She is a very knowledgeable person. So um, we will see you next Friday on Bernie's Apple Box. Thank you, Robert. You bet. Right. Thank you, Bernie. Thanks, Tony. All right.